Um, okay, so this is the two chapters on metadata and licensing. Uh, they kind of go well together, which is, I guess, why we scheduled to present them to go together. Uh, I think these are chapters eight and nine in the book. Um, so, yeah, um, so the metadata. So the first file I think about when we talk about metadata is the description file. And in fact, I think this, this is really the thing that really makes a package a package. Like you absolutely need a description file. Um, interesting thing about it is that it uses this uh, DCF format, DVM control format, which, you know, kind of looks like, you know, a lot of other markdown based formats you might see um, where, you know, you have fields on the left and colon separating the values on the right. Um, so here I just kind of ran, uh, used to use this to create a package, a uh, bad package. And here's what it, um, it creates in the description file uh, kind of as a, as a default for you. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really convenient because obviously you could copy paste over from an existing package if you have one, but obviously, uh, you know, use this exist to make your life easy as a life easier as a package developer. Um, so if you could just do that, or you could also set options in your global R profile, uh, and this will set personalized values uh, in that description file anytime you create a new package. Uh, in fact, I, I have this, and mine isn't too different from what the defaults are, but it's nice to have it around, and uh, they kind of mentioned that in the chapter. Uh, so, yeah, that title and description. Uh, so it's kind of like what you would expect. The title is a one-liner, and the description um, could be multiple sentences, usually spanning multiple lines. Uh, and, yeah, I don't know. There's not much to say about that, I think. There's some details about like, I think you need a full stop for both of these. So like a period at the end. Um, I think you have, if you have something malformed here, it's really good to use the uh, the good practice package. I don't think I have a link to it here, but um, I think it'll check for certain like nuances in your, in your description file, not only your description file, but your entire package. So it can be nice to check for, uh, you know, little errors uh, in here. It's a point uh, of curiosity about the title. Um, when it says title, it doesn't actually mean title in terms of like the name of the package. It means a one line description of your package, but it does should not include your package name itself. This tripped me up for like a while. I went back and forth with Crane embarrassingly on this one. And they're like, listen, just remove it. It's it's a, the title is actually a description. The description it, is it's, long. it's even better than that because if you look at the package panel in our studio, there's a description column which contains the title. <laughs> so <laughs> the title really is more of a description and then description is like long description. Yeah. If you wanna look at examples of a bunch of packages, what the titles look like, that description column is the title. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's not confusing just, at all. Just in case you guys try it, yes. But it's short description, long description. Yeah, that's, that's how they go. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's some of the easiest things to overlook, honestly, but it's obviously important when you're submitting a CRAN. Uh, so a quick question, do you need to have the description, like, or is it just optional? I think you that... need to for CRAN. Okay. I don't know if it will build without a description. I've always wondered that, because there's a few packages I have where I just... I just like can't think of like what to write in the description. So I just, it just is the same as the title just cause I wasn't sure if like it made you, cause I know use this when it gives you the skeleton it includes that. So I'm like, all right, I'll just do something. Yeah. I've never tried to not do it. Um, do I you know do <laughs> I could try it. Um, let's see. <laughs> I don't know if it'll I think it, I think it's the build part. Once, if it builds, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Aside from CRAN pains. Yeah, I'm not talking about like submitting to CRAN or anything. I love this layout so much. <laughs> Build along, right? 
So I need to actually change my description file. Uh, sorry, it's detected by this one. Uh, so take out description. The yeah, the description. And just build. Right? Well, I guess I, I don't know. If maybe I do install or something. If you go to um, go to your packages tab and see if it's like successfully there. Oh, uh, he only built it. He didn't actually build oh, and install. Right. Okay. Uh, control so you... Shift B. Yeah. That. Do that. And then <laughs> yeah, no, don't do that. And then you want to refresh the just refresh right at the point. top right of the panel. The zoom the y'all are in my way on the on our studio. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, you have to scroll down a little. Yeah. Yeah, it's there. And then, yeah, so it is optional. Yeah. Get they, that is um, the one thing that I got, or the thing, one of the things that I got rejected for my first time I submitted to CRAN was my description wasn't descriptive enough. So CRAN really cares. And in a good way, like it was really helpful feedback. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. Uh... Next thing is the author at R. Uh, this is kind of the one field in the description file that's weird because you actually use delete R code here. Um, I think there's probably other ways you can do this that are not uh, using R, but this is obviously the recommended way of doing it. Uh, so there's nothing too like confusing here. It's just maybe you'll have to add your name and email. Um, and email is important because they'll contact you. You know if you're trying to submit this to CRAN, that's the email they'll contact uh, you know, the author at. Uh, and then there's, you got this role field. Um, you know, I think you for sure need a creator and author, uh, but you know, anything like the contributor and copyright holder, um, those are other common roles, but I think for sure you need creator and author. Um, like those are the required ones. Um, like, so the copyright holder, we'll talk about that like a little bit later, but that could be like, your employer, uh, or I think the um, Tinyverse team uses puts like R Studio on there uh, as a copyright holder. As like you know who owns uh, you know all the the code. Yeah. Um, the other way that copyright holder gets used, actually, you might talk about this for the licensing stuff, but is if you have code that you use, you know, from someone else, you can mention them as a person with the role copyright holder, but then a note of what they are the copyright holder to. Mm, yes, yeah, they, uh, yeah, that's possible too. And I love that he has the reference to the full list that is yeah. <laughs> every possible role that someone could have in any project. There were some weird ones, like there was like a lyricist and like a, I don't know, like a carpenter or something like that. Uh, yeah, if you go to the full list, it really is pretty much any role that anyone could have on anything like a stage production or a package or a recipe book <laughs> like anything uh so yeah that's authors at r so url and bug reports also in the description file uh again not much to say here like url is kind of what you would expect to kind of get the home page of your package often people will um, create package down sites for their package and have it be that. Or it could be a completely separate website or it could just be your GitHub repo if you post it on GitHub um, you know, or in some other Git site. Uh, bug reports, I mean, I've almost always seen it be point to the issues page on the GitHub repo, you know, regardless of what the URL is. Um, I'm not, I don't know, like that, I would bet like 99% of packages are like that. I don't know. I almost don't even know where else you would point people to for bug reports, maybe like an email or something. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's really much beyond those two things to know for URL bug reports. Uh, so version and version also goes in the description file. 
Um, if you're not familiar with, I guess, the way, you know, the versioning that R has adopted, um, the major, minor, and catch, I think there's a, you know, there's a whole literature on, like, ways software can be versioned and, like, what's, you know, notation you use. Uh, but this seems like the simplest, and in fact, I think, like, uh, Python has started, like, a lot of packages over there have started using this kind of uh, format. Um, I think the, the, the use this function to know here is use version, which can be convenient for incrementing a version um, of your package. Uh, you always start at 0.900 or uh, when you're in, in development of your package. Uh, and you know, what quanti uh, you know what qualifies as like, or what deserves a version bump, uh, I guess it's going to be kind of unique to um, every package developer and their judgment. But I think the major, minor, and patch kind of really help um, guide you on that. Like if it's a breaking change, you know, that's going to be uh, a major uh, change. Uh, and then minor is probably like a release of new functions that really uh, help with workflow, um, like using your package. Um, and then patch is probably for bugs uh, in most cases. The thing that amuses me about version numbers is that everything in R is zero or is one indexed except for package versions. Like Tidyverse is finally getting to version one for most of their packages. Yeah. And, you know, clearly they've been at a first version for a long time, but we zero I, index package versions. Yeah, I think it's worse in the, the Python ecosystem where they, I think Pandas recently went to one, <laughs> even though it's existed since like, I don't know, the early 2010s maybe. Um, so, and I wonder, I wonder how it is in like JavaScript if they're like more, uh, like likely to bump their versions quicker or you know whatever type of versions. Um, I think it really depends on the yeah, package developer. Like I know the Drake package was at like, you know, major version like seven at least. I, I don't know, it might have been more than ten. Um, so it just it really depends. Uh, and then just speaking of depending, uh, here's dependencies. Uh, so the two fields to know here are imports and suggest. Uh, there's also depends, but that's um, not as recommended to use for packages at least, um, really more for specifying which version of R you're using. Um, so yeah, with, with the imports, uh, you use it to list packages that um, must be present for your package to work. Also things that you're, are going into your functions. Uh, and if you don't have a package that's listed in, uh, in imports, it, it'll be installed when you're installing said package. Um, so even if you, you know, it might seem a little redundant to put something in imports, but then also be namespacing your function, you know, across all your, your functions, um, that's still the best practice to do. Um, I, I don't know if it's actually like technically required. It might be, uh, but that's really like all I've seen before and all I've ever heard to do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's important. Um, suggest is for, you know, packages that, you know, can be, are, are used more, more likely in your vignettes or your tests, um, but aren't strictly required uh, for your package to run. And uh, those packages won't be installed uh, upon installing uh, your package. Um, and there are a couple, there's like two ways that Hadley mentioned of kind of handling these cases, uh, both involve uh, checking for the package existing uh, in the user's um, package library beforehand using require namespace. Uh, but yeah, there's there's ways of handling um, if, a, if a user doesn't have you know, a suggest package installed beforehand. Uh, and then yeah, the, the go to function for adding a package to your imports or suggests, of course you can do that manually, but uh, use this makes everything easier. So use this use package to add to imports or suggests. Uh, yeah, so, and here's where I mentioned depends earlier. Uh, this is where you can use it. This is just an example of like specifying uh, versions with your import suggest and depends. Um, you know, it's best practice to do this. Uh, you don't, you know, I don't, you don't have to do that with every package. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure like, you know, what's, you know, sometimes people list uh, like a package without these minimum versions. Um, I'm not sure like what's the, all the design choice behind it. Like I know it's, you know, something like, like 
Jeju Plot 2, where there's like major differences, you know, with 3.0 and above, um, for sure you're going to want to make a, a change there. But if it's like a package that only ever, you know, went to the 1.0 major version um, and it works kind of, it works with any version uh, with your package, um, and, you know, it may not be necessary to list the minimum. Uh, if you want to be really strict about it, of course, you can, uh, you know, put it for every package. And yeah, I just wanted to mention these other kind of fields that, that can exist in the description file, uh, linking to enhances and system requirements. Uh, so linking to kind of as it sounds, links to uh, code to other packages or code from other packages. Enhances is like a, just a, a aesthetic type of thing saying, oh yeah, this package kind of like improves upon another package. Uh, you no, know, Hagley kind of recommends not using it just because it's kind of ambiguous to like say that it enhances something. Uh, system, requirement, system requirements is kind of like a catch-all uh, for just listing other things that might be required. I'm not exactly sure what you would list there, maybe like kind of software like that's needed like for you know compilation or something. Uh, but even then there's other cases where, there's other places where you list uh, things like for about installing a C code or something like that. Uh, so yeah, the license file is kind of moving into the second chapter, but there's a little bit about it in the metadata uh, chapter because there is a license field in this the description file. Uh, so the big thing here to know is that there's two kinds of licenses, the permissive and the copyleft, and I need to fix the indenting on this. Um, I think the thing that really stood out to me here was like the stats on it, like so about 15% of uh, our packages use a permissive uh, type of license. Uh, I guess the most common one is there is a DMIT license. While, you know, other software across GitHub, about 55% use like such a permissive license. Where, and then on the other hand, you know, R is more heavy towards the copyleft packages, which are the uh, stricter uh, packages. Um, so there, yeah, about 70% of uh, grand packages uh, include a copy left type of license while only 20% of uh, GitHub packages do. Uh, so Hadley recommends looking at three, uh, as before I mentioned uh, the MIT uh, license, which is the, one of the more permissive ones. Then you have GPL two or, or three. These are copy left package uh, licenses. And then you have the Creative Commons uh, CC zero, which is a permissive type of license that's uh, intended mostly for data packages. Uh, so, yeah, uh, license is definitely required if you're going to uh, submit to CRAN. Uh, ironically, uh, the license.md should not go on CRAN, so that's something you would put in your R build ignore file. Uh, and I mentioned that because there's three places that uh, the license is relevant. You know, not only the license field in your description file, uh, there's also the license file uh, that's I commonly, I commonly think of that with the MIT license, which is the one I tend to use. Uh, and the license file, it lists the year and the copyright, uh, you know, of, of which you were using uh, the, the license. And then the license uh, MD is the actual text of the license itself. Uh, if, they're, if you're bundling code, external code, uh, the license.note may be appropriate. Uh, so maybe there's four locations where license is relevant in your package. And, you know, uh, creating a license is easy with the various use licenses uh, functions uh, and uses. Uh, so a little bit more detail. I mentioned MIT before. It's the most, it, it's not actually the most permissive. I guess the uh, com Creative Commons is probably the most permissive, but you say it's kind of more useful for data packages. Um, so yeah, there's the MIT one. Uh, it's really like a template that points to the license file that has more information about uh, the license and also, also the license.md with the actual text of the license. Aside from that, uh, Apache uh, is also on the more permissive side of things. Um, it's a lot like the MIT license, except that it has a you know explicit clause for patents. So maybe more useful in the academic sphere or the tech sphere. Then there's LGPL, the lesser uh, general public license, which I'll just say looks like mostly like GPL, 
Um, I didn't really do too much study until like what's the ex exact differences uh, with the GPL, but uh, GPL two and three are like some of the you know most known ones there. And the, like at this point, we're on the uh, the uh, copy less spectrum of licenses. Uh, meaning, I guess by copy left, the main thing I mean there is that those who use your code um, and distribute it uh, must, must also make the source available. Um, so, you know, I guess with the MIT license, a company could, uh, I mean, so with both the MIT and the GPL licenses, from what I understand, a company can, you know, use your code for something they're doing. Um, with the MIT license, they could then, you know, make that code proprietary and then distribute a product based off that code. Whereas with the GPL license, they couldn't dist uh, distribute a product based off that code unless they also open source that code. Um, so that's where the, I, I think that's from what I can tell, like the biggest difference between those two. And then the AGPL uh, license, the FARO general public license, it's a little bit even uh, um, more strict in its definitions. Um, basically making it so such that any like API or you know anything over the internet really uh, that you're sharing with your package uh, kind of falls into uh, the distribution uh, terminology there. So companies really have to be careful uh, if they're you know abiding by that license um, with how they're distributing their services. Okay, yeah. So the data packages we mentioned the Creative Commons one. Uh, there's also basically Creative Commons by where the author must be credited uh, for the data that they put together. Okay, so finally some other licensing things. I didn't really know how to separate those into like separate slides. So just kind of threw them all together. There's relicensing. So uh, this happens, this has happened actually a couple of times in tidyverse related packages where, uh, you know, uh, they want to switch from one license to another. Uh, so I think from what I've seen, it's like switching from GPL to an MIT license. So switching from a stricter, strict license to a less strict license. Um, often, I think, uh, yeah, so there you have to get um, acknowledgement or um, agreement from every contributor. So if you have a lot of contributors, this could be kind of a hassle. Uh, copyright holder. So we kind of mentioned this earlier about the, uh, about like you working for a company uh, and who owns the code and, and the package. Uh, so in the case of like our studio, this uh, and the Tidyverse team, you know, they'll, they'll put uh, our studio as the copyright holders. Uh, so code given to you. Um, so this, this actually uh, comes into play anytime someone like makes a pull request on a package uh, you developed. Uh, they're kind of implicitly agreeing to your license um, by the act of doing uh, the pull request. Um, but, you know, if they do good work for the package and really help develop it, um, you know, highly recommends kind of acknowledging that uh, in some way and as, you know, as much as possible. Or, um, so I think you see often with the Tidyverse releases, uh, they'll try to uh, acknowledge everyone that contributed to the new, the, an update to a package. Uh, and then some common cases when bundling external code. So I guess the people that work with Shiny a lot, this is probably relevant. Um, so and often, in a lot of cases, uh, you're not going to really have to do anything. You just have to check for if, if your licenses are compatible. So if your license is the same as uh, the, the code that you're using, um, as a license of, from the code that you're using, then you don't have to do anything. Um, if your license, if the, the, the code they're using, if it's using an MIT or BSD license, which we didn't talk about earlier, um, then you also don't have to do anything. Those are very, uh, those are less restrictive licenses. Um, if you're, if, yeah, if, if the external code is a, uses a copy left license uh, and yours is permiss permissive, um, do I have that right? Nope. Yeah, that, that one's wrong. Yeah, yeah it's I don't not have... do nothing. It's you can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think I, <laughs> yeah, I miswrote that. Okay. <laughs> That's a, I should have read through my slides beforehand. Um, <laughs> so the fourth one should be right. If you, you'll have to use a, 
more restrictive license if your license isn't as restrictive as the external codes license. Um, and I guess here's a diagram from Wikipedia on like kind of the relationships between some of these things. So you see MIT, BSD, and Apache, they're in the permissive side of the spectrum. Uh, and then over to the right, you have GPL2 and GPL3. And even farthest right is the FRO GPL. And LGPLs uh, somewhere in between. I didn't want to get into the, the weakly and strongly <laughs> protective stuff, or I think there's weakly or strongly copy left. Um, but I don't know. Those are all just kind of more restrictive uh, licenses, is how I would think about it. The thing I found shocking in this section was the note about Stack Overflow. I put that in yeah. The, yeah. the Slack. Like, what? So Stack Overflow uses the GPL3 license, which is near the, all the way to the right over here. So basically, if you use that, uh, then you have to use a GPL3 license in your package. I mean, depending on how much you use uh, the Stack Overflow code. Yeah, so he says it's CC BY. And so if that, that means that you have to give them attribution, I don't see why you couldn't do... Oh, I guess you can't do MIT because you can't require someone else to include the attribution. Okay. It's just, yeah. Um, <laughs> like, I need to add a license note for R3DS because, yeah, if someone answers your question, that's totally CC, CC0. If they try to stop you from using their answer, that's BS. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what if you, like, made a, instead of taking the Stack Overflow answer, and you, you're working on a package, and maybe ask them to make a pull request so then you don't have to, like, <laughs> yeah, I, request. I guess. Um, it's, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I guess, it, and then there would be, if this ever actually came up, there would be all the arguments of, well, did you actually copy and paste their answer, or did you, like, use the some of the code in their answer, and maybe you edited it, and, oh, now it's a new work or whatever. So, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I think you could easily argue that because it's yeah. rare that you're verbatim, like exactly, because you usually don't give your exact use case when you're asking questions of Stack Overflow. Right. Yeah. It's just, it, it, that was really surprising to me. I, it wasn't something I had ever thought about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah it, this has never been like relevant to me specifically, but I definitely can see where it's real. In fact, that's usually what this last slide is. It's like where some of these have con gone, um, been important. So I guess uh, this whole Tesla, you know, Tesla back in 2018 had this whole, um, I guess, argument of back and forth with the Linux people over not complying with the GPL license from the Linux kernel. So basically they were using a modified version of Linux for their technology, but, you know, hadn't open sourced their code. And then uh, I think they finally kind of uh, agreed and open source the parts of it that use the uh, Linux kernel. Um, so, and then ggplot2 is currently in the process of relicensing going from, I think it's GPL2, I have this, I have this up. Uh, it is a very long thread, by the way, <laughs> if you're interested, but it's recent from October um, here. So basically they had these kind of saying that they want to relicense all the RLib packages to MIT just to make it, I guess, clear, uh, like about who can contribute, just to make things less restrictive. Um, and there's this whole discussion about, you know, companies maybe using it advantageously for one reason or, or another. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not going to summarize the entire thing, but it's an interesting discussion. Um, and then finally, this was actually pointed out in the, that thread, I think, or somewhere else where. Uh, there's this tweet from 2013 between like Wes McKinney responding to Romain Francois about you know uh, RCCP and deployer and the speed of deployer versus uh, pandas and whatnot. And you know Wes is talking about the GPL license that uh, deployer at the time had, and he wasn't you know basically didn't really agree with it. He'd rather something he rather be more permissive. And, and in response. I think had they ended up making a change where they changed the deployer to MIT, you know, in response to uh, Wes's uh, thought here. Um, but this was kind of like somewhere, if you look at the whole discussion here, like it seemed like they, 
uh, they brought up the idea of having a, you know, the same underlying code for, you know, pandas and R or, and Defier and other languages implementing uh, data frames. So <laughs> this is in a way almost like spawn era. Like once Hadley open source, like, or like change the license to from board to fire, you know, maybe that gave some ideas of now we can collaborate and make data frames across software, you know, uh, more compatible and all that. So I don't know, I, I'm sure you guys have, have like interesting stories you may maybe heard of with licensing. I think this is a thing that happens in open source software and maybe goes under like, you know, not seen very often, but like maybe like Amazon adopts some technology or some software written by some single guy and, uh, you know, writing a package, um, you know, maybe to make some of their services easier. And then like a couple months later, they come out with something that's very similar that maybe shares a lot of the same ideas, but don't give like contribution or uh, give credit to the individual developers. So I can, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't have a ton of stories, but I imagine that kind of thing happens. It's, I just, I have a couple of contributions in the tidyverse, so I keep getting emails as they get to a new package where, you know, he talks about if you're relicensing, you can ignore ones that are just typo fixes or whatever. And, um, but I'm pretty sure he's being really careful. Like I know there are some where I just changed one word in a um, piece of documentation and I'm getting the email saying, or the whatever the GitHub issue that I'm tagged in, saying, "Do you agree to this license change?" Um, which I just, which stresses to me, like try to get it right when you create the package, yeah. because that's got to be so painful once you've got just hundreds of contributors um, trying to get all of them to say okay. It seems impossible to me. Yeah, yeah. Like, what if someone's like? not online anymore, right? Like, I, don't know, they I wonder, get off the internet. they must, their, their lawyers must be okay with them doing a best effort. And then they'd be able to argue that, that the person didn't complain and they can't now sue something like that. But yeah. it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've definitely seen in my industry, like where there's like, companies own the code that like, an individual employee writes, like so that an employee can go to another company, uh, another commercial company and like write code, similar code to them. Like th one company can sue the other company if like, you know, the, not, you know, the proper attributions aren't given. You know, they, they could say the employee, you know, took the code that they wrote at one company and, and you know, use it at the other company if they, you know, obviously if they have uh, enough evidence for that. But I've actually seen that before. So that's, I think that, you know, not only uh, it, it happens in the real world. Yeah, I've heard of that happening, but haven't had the experience, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. I know there was, um, there was a story somewhere in, I think it was in a random GitHub thread or something about how the, the head function the reason that it's six, that it by default gives you six results is it was actually written as part of a contract, um, a, a version of it that returned 10 results. And so they said, well, I'm gonna make a different version and I wanna make it different enough that is legally different. So now by default, it returns six results. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea if that's actually true, but I that's something that I heard Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I didn't, that's it. Um, there was actually a lot of material. I was at the beginning. I was going to say, you know, there wasn't a lot of material. I mean, there actually was. Uh, it's just like definitely stuff that you would just look up at the right time. Um, yeah. The I, the licensing chapter is new, and I think it's really helpful. Um, yeah. I'm going to be referencing it. We're going to do a check on. Um, Arbert and Arbert Viz, especially because we have some JavaScript code in there. And I'm like, oh, do we, do we do it right? I don't know that we really knew what we were doing when we did it the first time. I think it's right, but now we have the reference to go through. Um, so I found that really helpful, but the chapter eight has not been edited for the new version for sure. 
like it has it has references to dev tool functions that are now yeah. in use this um things like that so uh it'll be interesting to watch how that one changes i wonder what they're going to do with the license section in the uh you know the metadata chapter because there was definitely some it wasn't like repeated words but a lot of the the license stuff was like and i really shortened in the uh metadata so the older chapter um so i wonder if they're gonna like maybe keep it like that or uh really just leave the license chapter as a as its own thing and don't really talk about like it's the like the the license section in in metadata is mostly about how to note it not about what they mean so uh, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some changes, like for one thing, they'll refer to the other chapter, but um, I was at, at first, I was like, oh, this whole section is probably deleted. But then I read the licensing chapter. And I was like, oh, no, this is about like what a license is, not how to describe it. So I thought that was interesting. And it's, it is hilarious that I'm sure that chapter came about because they wanted to um, switch to MIT. And since they were dealing with that, they, uh, or he wrote it, wrote it all down. Sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone uh, have any uh, interesting licensing stories or metadata stories? I think it refers specifically, I don't know if this was covered, my internet dropped out for a bit here, um, but like I wrote an API package, the license refers specifically, I think my interpretation of it might be not the right interpretation, but refers to the R code and not to the API or the terms of use of the API itself. Um, so it's more like any code that's included within the package itself rather than the libraries that are that it's built on or um, you know, the APIs and accesses and so on. So I think that's the scope of the license. It has to cover like just the stuff that's in your Yeah, the, the thing that is in, the things that are in files in your package directory are what is covered by the license. And I, I liked the one way that he made that really clear is he talks about if you have something that's a more restrictive license that you want to use, just wrap that in its own package and then that package can have the more restrictive license. And then you can just call that package from your package that has the less restrictive license because you don't inherit a package. Uh, John Freeze for anyone else? Yeah, yeah, I was about to say. Like, <laughs> oh no. I think John had this, was saying something very profound and then like, <laughs> <laughs> that's so am i back am i yeah you're, you're john right is now. back john is back that, that john, was, john. <laughs> i don't know where i cut out that was weird i could hear you the whole time um so only my sending cut out apparently uh, some people you, you, moving you were just talking about like you know closing uh, you know having a separate package with the more restrictive license yeah, so he was saying just wrap the the restrictive part in its own package and then import that package in your less restrictive package because referencing a function doesn't corrupt your license because you're not including the code. All you're right. just using the code. Um, now, if it's AGPL, that might get iffy, I guess, because using the code could be... Um, could count as transmitting or whatever uh but the i liked that because i have um a piece of code that i don't really like the way it's licensed that i might wrap um part of a package is going to use that so I'm like well okay maybe that little that tiny little piece is going to be its own package now so i don't have to license the whole thing as um it's not even gpl3 it's a different copy left that I'm like i don't want to have to understand this license what's going on so but if you wrap it in a different package does that package also need to go to cran if you want the first package to go to cran yes it so would. it has to like stand alone and 
you're licensing it separately, but it's a set of functions that is dependent on by the only like only one other package. Basically. Possibly. I mean, it's it's wrapping some other code. Like that would be the purpose. So it's wrapping some JavaScript function or some you know something that exists somewhere else. So presumably there could be other uses for that thing, um, if it's worth you wrapping. Um, right. We'll see if it actually comes up because <laughs> I also might just re-implement the thing that I want to do. I don't really love the way that it's implemented already. So if I re-implement it, then you know I would have just used it. But you made your license more too restrictive. So now I'm gonna have to play. Um, but yeah, I, the whole idea that you were saying of that just using it doesn't the, that doesn't impact the license. So using an API, that API could be completely private, but your package isn't. Like your your pack, the license doesn't impact the fact that you're calling this API. Um, if their documentation is some crazy um, license, then you might have to start worrying, and, but then just don't use it anymore. Because <laughs> if they're licensing their documentation as uh, too strict, then that's getting too far. Yeah. I don't know if you're, you should be copying and pasting their documentation. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't copy and paste it. I just like if they're, you know, like if they had AGPL on their documentation, then you say, oh, okay, yeah. wait, what's going on here? Um, I can't link to their documentation, maybe. Wait. I don't know. Yeah, that, that license package just says, is a good uh, read. Because um, I think you know, eventually everyone's going to have probably going to have some kind of licensing uh, quandary. Uh, but yeah, that was that was definitely a new chapter because <laughs> I was yeah. like, I don't remember reading this. <laughs> yeah, he uh, Headley tweeted about it. Um, I don't know, a couple months ago, saying I wrote this new chapter. Take take a look. Let me know what you think. Blah blah blah. Um, and it it was good. 